and use it to harness our collective power. We worked our hearts out and proved that we can win, and we did win in Virginia. And last year, I did something I never thought I would ever do in my 62 years. Many of them as an activist. I ran for office. Wow, what an experience. I met people all over the Commonwealth of Virginia and was so energized by how many told me they had not done enough and they were getting more involved and many for the first time. So while this year my name won't be on the ballot, but that doesn't mean my job or yours is finished. We found out this year how important just one vote is. Shelley Simons was in a tied race for a seat in the House of Delegates. The winner was determined by picking one name out of a fishbowl. The Republican's name was chosen. No race should ever have to be decided like that. Now, I have worked for decades to increase women's participation in politics. And I believe in that cause with every ounce of my being. But let's not to forget to support the men who have always supported and empowered women like my friend, Senator Tim Kaine. <laughs> Senator Kaine, who stood proudly with Hillary Clinton who believes that women are capable of making their own decisions about their health and reproductive choices, who believes that every woman should have access to affordable contra contraception, who co-sponsored the Paycheck Fairness Act because he knows that men and women must be paid equally for the same work. And he pushed his colleagues to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, and who has also fought to make sure that women who serve their country in the U.S. Armed Forces are treated the same as their male counterparts. The Republican likely to challenge Senator Kane in November does not support any of those things. So now I ask you, it's time we go fight that battle one more time. So with that, would you welcome to the podium the guy we're going to fight that battle for too, my good friend and that of all of ours, Senator Tim Kaine from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Hey, Women's March 2018, you look great. Today, I want to talk about three anniversaries. The first anniversary of the Trump administration is a chaotic government shutdown, the Trump shutdown. The first anniversary of the Women's March is this fantastic gathering that's happening all over the country to show what democracy really looks like. And the third anniversary, well, I will get to that in just a couple of minutes. We are in the middle of a Trump shutdown last night. The Trump shutdown is due to the inability of the Republican Party to do basic governing like making a budget, something that everybody does at their own house. Just like the Republican effort to repeal health care, to take millions of people's health care away, or do tax cuts that benefit the few, not the many, or cut Medicaid and take Medicaid away from millions of people, this Trump shutdown is about hurting people and hurting our country. That's what they are doing. Four months into a fiscal year, with all the levers, White House, House, Senate, they can't even get a budget done. Democrats, Democrats told Republicans last night 
instead of forcing a shutdown, here's a novel idea. Why don't we just stay at the table and negotiate a budget deal that's good for education, good for health care, protects our dreamers, gives hurricane relief, and is good for defense? Why don't we do that instead? But when my Democratic colleagues made motions, let's not shut the government down, let's stay open to get that good deal, the Republicans shut the motions down, shut the government, because guess what? That's what President Trump had asked. He's been talking and tweeting about a good shutdown, and so that's why we're here in the Trump shutdown. But I make this pledge to you, along with my Democratic colleagues, while they want to walk away, we will stay at the table to find a fix. President Trump may have to cancel a trip to Mar-a-Lago. He, he may have to reschedule his jetting off to Davos, Switzerland. But we'll find a solution with your help. For our dreamers, for our troops, for our teachers, for health care, we'll find a solution. But I'm here for the happier anniversary. I'm here for this anniversary. One year ago, millions of women and the men and children who have their backs marched around the world to send this message. Women deserve to be heard. Women deserve to be respected. Women deserve to lead. It was, it was a tremendous honor for me to be the running mate for the first woman nominated for president by a major political party, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Hillary Clinton would have been a marvelous president, so much better than the alternative president we have now. But let me be serious, we know how tragic this is. It was not to be, the facts are plain. In a nation that does so many things so well, we have a terrible track record when it comes to electing women to national office. We, we know that we have never had a woman president, but we also know that the US ranks poorly in the world when it comes to women serving in elected positions. In 1997, 20 years ago, the U.S. was 52nd in the world in the percentage of women serving in national legislative bodies, and in 20 years we've fallen. We are now 104th in the world, behind the global average. Nations like Bolivia, Rwanda, Iraq, Afghanistan have a higher percentage of women serving in elected office than the United States. We have to do better. The march last year and marches all around this nation, you've inspired a great awakening. Women were dismayed when a qualified woman won the popular vote for president but lost an election to an unprepared and immature man who bragged about assaulting women. And women are dismayed at an administration set on reversing gains for women's health access, educational equity, sexual assault enforcement, basic acceptance of science, and so many other areas. But women are stepping up to lead and leading this nation to a great awakening and great revival. We see it. We see it in a powerful cultural change inspired by the Me Too movement. Women, and increasingly all people, are joining together, refusing to tolerate an unacceptable culture of sexual harassment and assault. We are not there yet, but we're getting closer to the day when women no longer have to suffer abuse in silence for fear of being ignored, belittled, intimidated, or fired, Powerful figures have been toppled off their bogus pedestals and revealed for who they are because women are speaking up. And 
we are seeing a powerful movement of new women political leaders, voters, volunteers, organizers, candidates. Some work in huddles or indivisible groups, some on their own, some through churches or nonprofits, some through political parties. The energy and strength of this new generation of engaged women leaders is obvious. And can I tell you one year in, it is working. It's working. In Virginia, in Virginia, the energetic activism of women helped us deliver an historic suite of our statewide offices in November, and our new governor installed a majority women cabinet for the first time in the history of the Commonwealth because he recognized who put him in office. And even more impressive, 15 Democratic newcomers and you've heard from some today, defeated Republican incumbents in our state legislative races. 11 of the 15 were women, first-time candidates, women of color, immigrant women, LGBTQ women. I was so proud that they won and so proud to campaign with them. You know that a month later in Alabama, we elected my friend Doug Jones in one of the reddest states in America, in, in his victory over a Republican candidate dogged by horrific stories of child molestation, the energetic participation of women, especially of women of color, sealed the deal, carried the victory, and was seen by all. And these are trends we are now seeing all over this country, women, women stepping up to vote, women stepping up to run, women stepping up to win, and women stepping up to lead. Let me, just, let me just conclude and say this. As I stand here and look at you, and as I think about the last year, the pains and the challenges, but the activism too, I think 2018 can be a breakthrough year for American democracy. When women achieve equal representation in our government, it will transform our policy and it will transform our politics. A huge win for women candidates in November will set the stage as we prepare for the third anniversary I want to talk about. The 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment in 2020 when we celebrate the centennial of women getting the right to vote. That's the third anniversary that I want to talk about. Imagine it. Nearly 100 years after women gained the right to vote, the progress in women representing us in government is still so very, very weak. But a change is coming. You are the change, and you have awakened this nation. We won't tire. We won't rest. Standing in this place, as hundreds of thousands have had throughout our history. We claim the equality of women, all women, as our North Star, and we pledge our efforts to making our union more perfect by elevating women in every last corner of this country. Thank you, and God bless the work you are doing. It's great to be with you today.